Welcome to Mad Props with Chris Schnabel. I know if you're if you're coming in, you might be like, Mad Props. I think this was called off stage. And you'd still be wrong because then it also changed to all ears. Well, now it's neither of those. It's Mad Props. I'm so excited about this name. I've been I've been dying to get a name that I loved. All ears was okay. Off stage obviously means a lot to me, but this is this is it. This is it right here. I'm Chris Schnabel. I'm your host. Uh, today, we have an awesome guest, Julius Thomas III. He is a Broadway uh, a veteran uh, and some NAACP Theater Award uh, nominee and just all around a good dude. Uh, it's going to be an awesome one. So definitely get, get ready. Get ready. Take a seat. Put the, put the imaginary seatbelt on and get ready to go. But uh, So he plays Hamilton right now. That's where I saw him. I actually saw him. I went to go see Hamilton. Um, it was an amazing show. I couldn't believe how good it was. I've never seen a live theater show before. And then I saw Hamilton and I was like, I have to talk to this guy. Like I have to talk and I, I have to get to know this guy. This guy was so good. And, and uh, it's been, it, and here we are now, right? Here we are now. But it's funny that he plays Alexander Hamilton, right? I'm going to bring you on this one. How much do you know about Alexander Hamilton from your history books? Producer Ray, Ray this, Ann this Allen, much. by the way, you probably remember her from previous episodes. You remember almost nothing you're saying. Have you seen Hamilton? No, it's $10 bill. Yeah, <laughs> no, not the $10 bill, the, the stage play, the stage play Hamilton. Not even on Disney Plus? Mm, I saw bits and pieces of it, like on Disney Plus, but no, I haven't. But, you know, I think they're coming up in Seattle. So honestly, I might go drive up and see it. <laughs> Yeah, that I first of all, yes, it was so good. It was so good. I was surprised. Like, there's obviously inaccuracies because it's a musical. <laughs> They're not gonna, they, they can't do it all. It's funny. I was watching the second time I went to go see. I went to go see it with my girlfriend Mary, and uh, I leaned over to her and I was like, "Wow, I knew a lot about history, but I didn't realize there was so much singing and dancing when this was all happening." <laughs> they leave that out of the history they, book. They leave that they out of the history book entirely. Definitely. But it was just such a cool take on it. And there was, there's obviously inaccuracies because it's a story, but a lot of the stuff was pretty, from, from what I remember was pretty, pretty on point. And a lot of the stuff I didn't really know about Alexander Hamilton that was in it. I went and researched to see, was this true? Was it not? And the stuff that was true was surprising. No, it was actually really surprising is, no. do you know how he died? You haven't seen it. Do you know how he died? No. And my, my aunt's history teacher, she's just like, I can hear her right now. She's like, Ray. Why don't you know this? We've talked about this. No, we haven't. But so, <laughs> so it's crazy. I knew how he died. He died. Mm -hmm. And spoiler alert for people who haven't seen Hamilton. It's U.S. history. You should know this. He died in a duel. He died. Aaron Burr killed him in a duel. Aaron Burr is also a character in the show. Like they dueled and he shot him and he killed him. And it's surprise. It was just surprising to me because like, like going into that, I knew that. Like I knew Alexander Hamilton died in a duel. Like. I thought it was just like common American knowledge, but it's not like a lot of people I knew were like, oh, that, it was crazy when he died. In the I'm like, crazy. Yeah, no, you didn't know he I died in a duel. Like that. this is like this. This is something that happened in American history. Like this isn't they didn't make that up. He actually died in a duel from Aaron Burr. That's why like in the history books, Aaron Burr is looked at as such a villain because he killed Alexander Hamilton. Like it's just. Yeah, but it was really good. I definitely recommend going to see it, but we're not going to take up too much more of your time. We want to get right into this interview. So let's cut it. Let's get right to the intro video and then get on to the interview with Julius Thomas III. Let's do it. Hi, I'm Julius Thomas III. Let's start the show. So our guest on today's show is a, a Broadway veteran who's been in things like uh, Motown. And right now he's in Hamilton on the national tour playing Alexander Hamilton. So he's not just in Hamilton. He is Alexander Hamilton. Julius Thomas III. Julius, how's it going? How are we doing? How's the tour doing? Good morning. It's going really well. We are currently in Vancouver, Canada. It's my first time on the, you know, the, this side of Canada. And I'm just enjoying myself, man. We've got some sun today. <laughs> it's uh it's, and the audiences are great so it's all so, good over here in the pre-show we we're talking a little about the weather now you were just in spokane washington and that's where the show is based out of go zags and uh the weather here has been ridiculous it's been like in the 40s in the 
50s, raining, doesn't want to make up its mind. It was 70 this week, which was – that was nice. That was nice. I, I like that it was 70 finally, but just the weather has been crazy. Were you able to actually go out and do anything in Spokane? Like, were you able to see any sights with the weather just kind of being rough? Yeah, um, Spokane was actually a lot of fun, minus the weather. I mean, you saved those 70-degree <laughs> days until after we left, and I, I think that's kind of rude, but that's fine. We'll get over it. <laughs> I'll let them um, know. I'll let them know. Hey, listen. <laughs> please do. Next to time, the power turn up the heat a little please. bit. <laughs> um, yeah, but yeah, I did get out and explore the city. I went out and ate at different restaurants um, and visited several of your comic book shops. I'm a big comic book fan, a graphic novel reader. Yes. And I can tell that you've got some stuff back there in the background. Oh, that, yeah. Uh, I, I would pull the, maybe, maybe, maybe later in, I'll pull the camera. I have comic books lining. I, you know, I kick ass. I have Spider Man. I have Hit Girl. But I have, I have, they're just lining the top. Like, nice. <laughs> I love it. Nice. Yeah. So I visited a couple of the comic book shops. And, um, you know, the show doesn't leave me a ton of time to go out and be social and do stuff. But I, I made, made a uh, point to visit at least a few places while I was there. So did you the did you hit the shop? Uh, there's a comic shop in downtown Spokane that's attached to a pizza parlor. Did Merlin's? you hit that one? Yeah, did you got to that yes. one? That's yeah, a, I went I, on, that's a good one. I went on Free Comic Book Day, which was which is always fun. You know, when, <laughs> I've been on tour for the past I don't know three or four years now, and I've, this is my seventh tour. So I've done like seven free comic book days all over the country and it's always fun to just go see what the um what the locals in whatever city are excited to do on free comic book day and i met like people dressed up as batman and you know got my free <laughs> comic books and supported some of the shops it was it was a lot of fun uh, you know we there's a chance we could have just passed each other and not even known it <laughs> it's true <laughs> so we could have passed right by each other and not know you could have been the person in the batman suit <laughs> uh, i would never tell i would never tell <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't give it up that easily, but actually the, the Lilac comic cons coming here too. Um, there's some yeah. good writers going on. So there, there's a good presence of people that like comic book. There's, there's a comic book shop, the chain. There's like four of them in Spokane alone. That just, there's one in the North. There's one in the South. There's one downtown. There's it's So there's a good presence of it. I'm originally from New York. I'm not from Spokane. So I've all, I've also had to get, you know, find out what are the good shops? Where are the bad shops? Stuff like that. Okay. You know, when I, Cool. By the way, when I first when I was thinking of doing this interview, I did not think the first five minutes of it would be talking comic books. But I, you don't know how excited I am in the first five minutes. Surprise! <laughs> oh, I love it. I absolutely love it. But I'm glad that you got to go out and Spokane and see some things. What were some of your favorite restaurants to eat at? Oh, now now that's put me on the spot. I don't <laughs> remember the name of it, but there was this fantastic little bistro that I went to on one of my days off. Um, and then there's this really cool area um that's i want to say like right up against the water that's just sort of new and built up it's got a the kendall uh, yards the kendall yards yeah i went mm -hmm. over there and had some ice cream in one of the ice creameries that you guys have got the over scoop? there the scoop that's yeah. it yeah um so I, I have to run a little bit but i i struggle to remember names because this is city well, i want to say <laughs> number 12 or 13 on this tour yeah you you can remember every step every word of a show i'm okay with you not remembering kenley arts and the scoop i Thank you. I, I so I'm, I'm originally from new york and i've never been to a show which is just the most absurd thing you probably ever what are you doing i, I no. know <laughs> until until i got here i i went to hamilton so my girlfriend was out of town it was just after graduation my girlfriend was out of town and my parents just left town and i was like looking for something to do and i saw the tickets to hamilton were available and i was like I, that'd be awesome like i've always wanted to see hamilton i've never really been to a show i saw the book of mormon as a like really rip off online version of with the original cast so that's like the closest i've ever been to seeing a, a show yeah. so i was like I'll, I'll go see hamilton and uh, for unbelievable it was unbelievable you were unbelievable as alexander hamilton just you were so good um but it doesn't stop there. Then when my girlfriend came back, she wanted to see it too. So I actually saw it twice while you guys were in Spokane. And the second time, not, uh, no, I was kidding. It was great. It was a great second time too. It was just, it was so much fun. It was so cool to like, you, you when you see things like shows that are put on to, to screen, it's like, you don't get to see the whole thing. You don't see like all that goes on, on it. Like 
the the people putting out this stuff bringing back this stuff how every everyone's intertwined in every way it was just it, it blew my mind and for somebody that puts their phone down and can't remember where it is for you guys to remember where to put the soapbox on the spinning stage it just blows my mind so yeah it's interesting it's an interesting concept like when you film theater someone is choosing the adventure for you you know, in Hamilton, you, when you watch it on Disney Plus, and it's beautifully filmed, one of the best versions of a, of a filmed um, musical I've ever seen. Um, they choose your adventure for you. They tell you exactly where to look. They center the, the thing that they want you to focus on. But when you come to see a live show, you get to choose your own adventure, which I think is very cool. And every time you come to see the show, I'm sure you probably on the second time notice things that you didn't see the first time around. Yeah. And with a show like Hamilton, with so many different moving parts and pieces, you literally could come see the show. And with, with the cast ro rotating so much, you could come back and see the same show 18 different times and see a completely different show every time you come. So it's the theater is such a magical thing. And I love it so much. I love to go see it. I mostly love to do it, but I also love to sit in the audience and be wowed by what other artists can do. And sitting in the audience, um, one of the show that really got you into uh, theater was Rent. You saw Rent uh, back in Chicago, which is where you really got your start. Um, did you see Tick, Tick, Boom when it came out on Netflix? Which is, uh, they're both, did, they're both not, Jonathan Larson. Yes, I have not seen uh, the Netflix Tick, Tick, Boom, um, but I did see a production of it in college when I was, uh, you know, training to be an artist myself. And it's a really interesting and kooky, quirky kind of show. Not really my gig. Um, I do love Rent and it did change my life. But um, Tick, Tick, Boom is, is uh, I don't know. I don't know why Tick, Tick didn't hit me the same way. I can see. I mean, I, the, the film itself is like kind of almost like a biography slash the, the musical in it. So like the music numbers are from Tick, Tick, Boom, but it's kind of also talking about his life. It was really good. I also love Andrew Garfield. So like oh, he's so watching great. it. Yeah, it's watching Andrew Is he Garfield your favorite is... Spider-Man? Going into no now, can we do No Way Home spoiler? I'm sure we can. I'm you. If you were your comic books yeah. haven't seen No Way Home, I don't even know why I'm asking. Um, <laughs> going into it, I wasn't the biggest fan of him as Spider-Man, but I didn't think it was more because like the writing for him was not great. Like him as Spider-Man, looking back at it, especially he was very good as the role, but it just wasn't written well. Especially the Amazing Spider-Man Two, which is that really even something like, can we just forget that? <laughs> like, <laughs> but See, I, I thought he is way too cool to be Peter Parker. Like he's Same. such a cool guy. He's such a cool, he's, he's a fantastic actor. And I never for once in that movie believed that he was bad with girls or, you know, quirky or awkward. Like, you know, the, the quintessential Spider-Man for me is the nineties cartoon and that yes. Peter Parker. And yes. so, you know, I, I, I don't know. He's just a little too cool to be Spider-Man in my mind. But I wanna go back for a second and just yep. talk about the fact that you have not seen a Broadway show when there was <laughs> Spider-Man on Broadway. How did you skip Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark? Uh, I guess the same way that all the other ones went by. <laughs> I never got to go to see it. I mean. Growing up, I didn't grow up in the heart of New York or anything. I grew up about 30, 45 minutes. South, or, I mean, with traffic, it's like three hours, but, you know, a little outside uh, the city. So getting into the city wasn't always the easiest thing. And then um, when I went to school, I ended up going to school in Florida. Then I went to school in Connecticut. Then I moved to Boston. Now I'm out here. So like I was moving around a little bit and I'm just making excuses at this point because mm -hmm, <laughs> I wasn't mm -hmm. able to get out and see a show. But I noticed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just all excuses that just to act like it's it's right that I didn't go see a show. I'm actually upset at myself after seeing Hamilton and being so good and seeing all the things around. I was like, man, I should have at least seen one. But I know uh, it's it's no, yeah, this is wrong. great, though, it's because wrong. if you want to end the interview to... now, I get it. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> I no, I, I think it's fantastic because now you have the rest of your life to fall in love like the rest of us. And yes. there's some really amazing stuff out there. And if you loved Hamilton, there's plenty of stuff out there that I think that you would be interested in. Like my next thing for you, I would say would go see In the Heights. If you can find a production of In the Heights, same composer, really awesome story, very urban, very New York. So, you know, not too, not too far away from home. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to look into that. I actually, to be honest with you, I was going to go see 
<laughs> Moulin Rouge because the guy I interviewed did the composing and I'm like, okay, I have to go see it. Like, but then 2020 happens and not able to go see anything. Was that, was that kind of tough? So you were, you were touring for about a year, a little over a year at that point. Right. And then 2020 happens and everything shut down. Was it tough to kind of shut down in the middle of it? Yeah, I, this, I had joined this company and had been with them for about a year. I'd been with Hamilton. This is my fifth year uh, with the show itself. And so I had done a, a previous tour. So I got a, a real good core um, moment to be with the show and sort of fall in love with it and learn everything that I needed to learn. And then took over the role of Hamilton after Lin-Manuel Miranda did the um, little stint in Puerto Rico. And so that company, along with myself, went to Puerto Rico. And then we came to San Francisco where I took over. And um, we went about a year and some change, and we were just about to announce another nine month extension when on a Wednesday matinee, right around the next to last number, the rumor started you know, circul circulating around the theater saying like, they're canceling, the, they're canceling the evening show. We're probably gonna be closed for the next two weeks. And at that point, it was, crazy it was like oh theater we never cancel a show like it could be rain sleet snow there could be two people in the audience it is very rare that a producer will cancel a show so I knew that something was going on uh, when that happened and then to hear about the NBA sort of you know cutting closing down games and things of that nature I was like oh something's going on and they said two weeks but once I noticed that those things were happening in my brain I was like we're not coming back anytime soon if if nba is shutting down if we're canceling shows like we're going to be out for a little while and then cut to 18 months later my goodness um i'll just say that the pandemic was both a blessing and a curse for me obviously i did work uh, uh in an official capacity in a show for that entire time but i learned a lot about myself and I created my own business and started performing via Zoom and, you know, um, writing and, and really doing a whole bunch of self-exploration. So some really lovely things came out of a, a really, really terrible time. And during that time, you were, you said you were performing. You were also, I believe you were writing a book and you're recording an album. Now, I should know this with the research I've done, but how, how is the book coming along? How is the album coming along? Have they been released? They have not. So the wonderful thing about the pandemic, the blessing was that there was copious amounts of time. And you know how we were talking, <laughs> you were talking about um, that so many things, Netflix and things that happened during the pandemic, we are going to be seeing, I think a golden age, we are already in a golden age of television and film, but the stuff that got written during that time and finished is now in production and is in the works. And I think for the next like five to 10 years, we are going to be in like visual and entertainment heaven. Um, so I I'm still working on my stuff. I have a lot less time to do so and a lot less ability to do so. You know, when you're working on an album, you wanna sit down with a composer, you wanna sing, you wanna work on it, you wanna do all of the things, but I do seven shows a week um, and usually without fail. And you saw, I rarely leave the stage. It is high velocity use of my voice. And so uh, the album stuff is coming along. It's just coming along a lot more slowly because I can't do the kind of work that I would like to do because it would jeopardize the work that I'm paid to do. And the book is sort of on the shelf. Like I'm, I'm writing a, a children's, not children's, but a young adult um, story that's sort of science fiction, fantasy, the stuff that I really am in love with. Um, there's so many irons in the fire. I've got a, a, um, a television series that I'm on episode two of that I'm writing. And there, all of these things are nothing but my own self-expression. I'm not looking to become the next big writer, to write the next musical or to, you know, if those things happen, fantastic. But what I'm really just trying to do is to see who Julius is outside of theater. And the pandemic was the time where I started to explore that. And you know, it's, um, it's crazy because it, it's felt like shows and podcasts and everyone was getting on those trains because of the same thing. Like it was one, what are you trying? You're either trying to come up with something creative or playing animal crossing. Like you were doing one of the two during the pandemic and, and uh, just all this stuff came out. And now it's interesting to see what is still with us. 
you know, what podcasts are still around, what shows are still around, which people are still around after doing that during the pandemic. And it's just been interesting. It's interesting to have gone into it, been in the middle of it, and now kind of coming out of it a little bit, hopefully more soon. Like it, it's just interesting to see. So you said you're writing a TV series. Is there any preview we can get of that? Like just a little snippet of what it might be about? Yeah, I mean, I wanted to, it originally just started as a short film. I just wanted to do a 20 minute situation in which I explored trauma and or putting a name to trauma that young African-American men uh, deal with. You know, we watch series that are sort of in the same vein. We see um, people just sort of like living a slice of life and watching how their life unfolds. And I, I look across the the plethora of TV shows. And it is rare that you get a show that just follows the lives of two or three Black guys and how their lives are affected by the, the day-to-day goings on. And there are no heavy, there are no heavy themes. It's not racially motivated or anything of that nature other than the, the, the leads are African-American because we actually lead lives and are normal and boring and have slices of life as well. <clears throat> and so that's what I just wanted to do was like, just see myself up on the screen in a way that it is rare that I see myself in the leading capacity, telling my story um, and having it be both boring and interesting and just normal. And so that's sort of the, the focus of it. Of course, there's gonna be lots of drama because you can't have television without drama. Of course. Can't just be like nothing going on. But um, it, it really isn't centered around anything that that most uh, of the media that I have seen and grown up with sort of centers around. So when you're writing this, is this written about you or more for you or kind of this, both of them? Like, is it written for you about you or is it kind of just more you're trying to make it about your life and say you couldn't take the role someone else could? Someone else definitely could. Um, I, I actually, I'm using myself and two of my buddies as the um, as the main characters. And but it's not our. It's not. It's definitely not our lives. But it definitely pulls from our lives and the experiences that we have had together and shared with each other. Um, we've got this really interesting. Uh, what's the the app called? Messaging app. I can't remember the name of it right now. But um, we all have this messaging app that we are on together. Okay where we literally just sit and solve the world's problems. Anything that comes up, we're usually like, y'all, did you see that this, 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 and that happened? And this is what would happen if I were in that situation. And I can't believe that you did it. We just sit and we mull over the things in life that are going on in the world. Right now, we're clearly talking about the shootings that are happening so rapidly and frequently across the country. And it's just so awesome to have this space with these intelligent African-American men who have become like my brothers and we laugh and we cry and we joke and we we solve the world's problems. And I, and I just found something so very interesting and missing um, in our media that I think this, this has a space for. So it's just for my self-expression, but if anything else comes out of it, fantastic. And that's the best way to do it. You know, the, the worst, maybe not the worst, but one of the worst ways you can come up with things is to come up with things to either be famous or make it big. Like the best things come from people that are just trying to express themselves, express their story, want to get their story out there. Like they're the biggest channels that you see are channels of things that people enjoy doing. And then they're just so good at it because they love doing, it, you know, so to hear that's just something you love doing and love being a part of makes it that much more, that much better you know, that much better for not only you, but for going forward, because it's something you love doing. Yeah, and I mean, I'm not, I, I'm not a writer. I don't claim to be one, but after I wrote the 20 minute little situation, um, I had several people say to me, oh my gosh, this is such a fun series. Oh my goodness, I could see this done this, 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 that, and that way. Oh my goodness, this is, this is gonna be so funny. And, and in my brain, I had written something completely different. It was like, a 20 minute short that was very heady and very um, emotionally driven and, and uh, I, I, don't, I don't know, a dr dramatic. It was very dramatic and serious. And everyone else apparently saw a dark comedy and saw a series and lots of other stuff. And it may, really made me start to think like, okay, so here's the part of the self-expression that I was 
thinking of. I wanted to know if I could write something. I wrote something. I wanted to know if it would speak to people. It's speaking to people. And they're saying that this is what it is. All right, let's see if that's exactly what it is. Let's explore that. And it's just this sort of like leafy branch that just sort of like is going in all of these different directions that I never expected. So <clears throat> yeah. you say you're not a writer, but you're an artist. You're an artist. You, you can create things that can reach people that can touch people. And that's what you don't have to be a writer to do that. You have to be an artist. You have to be someone that can can reach in and grab the heartstrings. And that seems like that's what it's doing. I'm excited to see where it goes. I'm excited to see what happens. I will say I'm, I'm going to be yelled at if I don't ask more about uh, about Hamilton, because obviously you're the star of Hamilton right now. You're going across the country doing it when you first auditioned for Hamilton, though. And I know you probably get this question a lot. When you first audition, you didn't want to be Hamilton. You wanted to be Burr. You said Burr was more. Now you're five years in. Do you think that has definitely changed where you're like, no, Hamilton's the right spot for me? So it's a yes and no. So I am definitely in my real life more of a Burr. I am definitely more uh, calm and even keeled and I wait for it. I go about things the right way. I'm a rule follower. Um, <clears throat> but when I was playing Burr, I never felt like I truly grasped and understood the character. Um, I got to, I only got to play him four times and I know it takes more than that to sort of like embody a thing. <clears throat> but the first time that I played Hamilton, it clicked. Something inside of me clicked. And I, I just knew how to play this character in a way that felt honest and, and truthful and, and dif very different from Lin-Manuel, but, but, but also valid. And something about Burr, even though I identify with him so fiercely in my normal life, just it, it wasn't clicking for me when I would, would play him or rehearse him or work on him. So I definitely feel like I'm where I'm supposed to be playing the character that I'm supposed to be playing. Uh, and also in my normal life, I'm a little bit more of a Burr. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you're playing the key role character, obviously one of the biggest characters you talked about. Uh, Lynn manuel playing him. Um, was there any little extra pressure when you went on to him? I know you said that you saw it before you auditioned, you saw it once, like right before you auditioned. You didn't see it before. Um, I feel like that might have helped you bring yourself more into the character instead of trying to replicate Lynn more. I don't know how you feel about that, but was there like a little added pressure from there too? Because I mean, it, was, it became so big, he became so big from it, and now you're trying to follow in his footsteps. Yeah, so. Uh... The only pressure that I ever felt in this situation was to do my best work. Like when you're gifted the opportunity to take the biggest role in the world, in the biggest show in the world that is changing the way that we see theater, think about theater, who sees theater, how we listen to it. I mean, the, 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 this show has like, there hasn't been a show that has really changed the game like this since Rent. You know, there have been lots of innovative and fun things and things that have really blown up, but there hasn't been stuff that have, has really shifted the genre. Now you see everybody trying to put their show on Netflix, trying to record it, trying to do X, Y, and Z, whereas theater before was very averse to things like that. And so I, I, the only pressure I ever felt was to do my best work because I didn't know the show like everybody else. I didn't know the show like the way that Lynn did it. Um, I, like you said, I saw him do it once in the theater. I called in a favor from a buddy of mine who I worked in that theater before I'd done the Gershwin's Poor Game Best. And I called up the house manager and I just was like, hey, is there any way that um, I can, you know, do X, Y, and Z? And he was like, I don't know. You know, this, this show is like always sold out, but some magic happened and I was able to like stand in the back in the corner. Um, and <clears throat> I'm so grateful for that moment. And also when I went in to do the audition, I put all of that to the side because putting a hat on a hat on a hat as an artist, you know, like trying to do Julius's interpretation of Lin-Manuel Miranda's interpretation of his idea of Hamilton is like so far removed from any reality that I actually know that it just wouldn't have been good. So I'm glad I didn't consume it like crazy because it just allowed me to go in and tell a story in the honest way. And I think that's what kind of happens when you hear like, you know, this portrayal wasn't as good as the original or this because the per you've seen it so much and you've seen this person so much and the person taking over has seen it so much instead of embodying the character, they're embodying the person who played the character, like you said, wearing a hat on a hat on a hat, like you need to put your own character into it. So I really think that helped you make Hamilton yours like that. That is your character now because you weren't really 
uh, you weren't really like watching Lynn and being like, oh, he does this. Oh, he does that. I need to make sure I do this because that's what he does. Like, I need to make sure I do exactly what he does in that situation. So it really helped you there. Yeah. I think what a lot of artists um, miss out on is that their secret weapon is themselves. Like the thing that people are interested in is your perspective. And so if you can bring your perspective to something that is uh, your, your genuine, honest and good perspective to something that, that is already established, sure, you'll have those people that are like, that's not the original. We have people, you know, we're six years out and people are still writing me, comparing me to Lin-Manuel Miranda. And I'm like, but that, that show ended many, many years ago. Lynn hasn't been in the show in four years now. Like there, there is no, there's no more Lynn as far as the, a live performance of Hamilton is concerned. I hope to God we do see him play the role again. But as of right now, that's, that thing's dead. Like if you want to see that, go watch the Disney Plus. If you want to hear that, listen to the album. And I think that that's wonderful. But this thing is living and breathing. And in order for it to be continue to live and breathe, we have to inject new life into it and new perspectives and new um, new people onto it. Yeah, can't can't say, but you can't grow if you're trying to stay the same. You see, with you know, you see that with a lot. You see it with bands that they find their sound and they do that for 25 years, and people say, "Well, this is stale now." It's you got to grow, you got to evolve, and that's how you just keep staying in the game. And same with anything. It's really same with any. Same with TV. Same with theater. Same with anything. Be like Madonna. Just keep reinventing. <laughs> <laughs> so when, when you guys are going across the North American tour, you say you play, what, C said, seven shows a week. What is touring like? Is it a lot like with, if you're a musician, like, are you, do you get vacations? Do you get days off? Do you get to, how's the, like, how's the personal life? How, how are your relationships outside of it? Is it tough because you don't get to see people as much? Yeah, there's, I mean, that's a, that's a ton to cover, but I'll see if I can do it in a succinct, <laughs> succinct sort of. So I do seven shows a week. The, the show runs eight. The vocal lift is so heavy that they give me one extra show off a week than, than everyone else. Um, we are off on Mondays. In a lot of cases, that Monday is the travel day between cities. Um, Theater in and of itself is a grueling business. It is not for the, the faint of heart, you know, the, the week. People think that it's just like you step out on stage and you sing for a couple of minutes and then you go home and you can party and, you know, that artists are just sort of like la-di-da, willy-nilly. But my life is much more restricted than most people. Like my life is way more restricted than a nine-to-fiver who puts their job down at nine uh, at five o'clock and goes home and can go out on the weekends and all of that stuff. I don't have that um, because we work on the weekends. We do two shows a day on several days of, uh, of the week. My body is my instrument. And so I can't go out and sing, uh, speak loudly or go out to karaoke or spend a lot of time doing, you know, things that might injure my body because that means I can't do the show in the way that I need to do it. So um, it's, it's a bit of a restrictive life. And with different shows, it, it is different. Like I've been in shows like the 25th annual Putnam County Spelling Bee. I could do that show standing on my head, upside down, backwards, <laughs> turning around in circles. Um, but this show requires, a, a, you know, to whom much is given, much is required. It's a big, it's a big ask. So uh, right on down to having conversations with my loved ones, like they all understand at this point in my life that like you get very little of me because we can text, we can leave little Marco Polos. That was the name of the app I was trying to remember earlier, but we're not gonna get on the phone and have an hour long conversation because then I have to go rap for three hours. Um, it's just not feasible. So my, my personal relationships, while they, I don't feel like they are suffering, they are definitely sidelined at the moment. And thankfully all the people in my life understand what it is that I'm trying to do and that this is just for time. But um, it's definitely a sacrifice. It's definitely something that you have to give yourself over to if you want to do it the way that it needs to be done. Yeah, and I, I mean, I, I can't speak as an expert. I've only seen two shows live, but seeing a concert and seeing a show like Hamilton are two completely different things in a, in a concert. Yes, they're singing every night, but they can take the breaks. You see on the big songs, they let the crowd sing it. They have those breaks. You can't do that. You can't let the crowd sing your song. You have to do it night in and night out. It was just, I was just so impressed to go watch you guys do that. I really was. I, I, I could talk about that all day of how impressive it was. 
to watch that and to see that and, and and stuff like that. We have a couple more minutes here. I just want to ask a couple like just questions to get you know you a little better. So what is other than theater and I mean it sounds like that's <laughs> basically every day all the time but outside of that what else are you into? I know we we talked about comic books. Do you have favorite sports teams things like that? What is uh Julius's favorite thing outside of theater? Stuff I should say. Oh, that is a good question. Um I love my Wii, not my Wii, my, um, what's that Switch. new thing called? My Switch. I love my oh, Switch. Oh, I'm going to have to add you on the Switch. I love this. I play Switch all the time. <laughs> okay. You'll have to teach me how to do all that because I'm technologically I got you. unadvanced. <laughs> I absolutely but, got um, you. I am in the middle of playing both Zelda and, uh, uh, I don't even know how to say it. The new Pokemon game, Arceus, Arceus, uh, Arceus. whatever it's called. Arceus, Arceus Legends yes. or Legends Arceus. Those are. Those are my two that I spend lots of time playing. Um, I love, I consume a lot of television and film. I think that we are in the, like I said, in the golden age. I love a Miyazaki film. And every year they do the, um, the, the uh, Ghibli Fest, Studio Ghibli Fest. So I go and see a lot of the uh, Miyazaki films in the theaters. And so that's the kind of stuff that I love to do. I love to consume media. I love to play my little video games. I'm an avid gym guy. I'm in the gym probably four times a week, the show permitting. Um, yeah, those are sort of my things. That's, first of all, Legends Arceus is great. Open world concept. It's just a new new switch to Pokemon. It's like I should have booked you for my my nerd podcast. Like I have a, one that we talk about all this stuff. I should have booked you for that one because it's just, we could have talked for hours about that but uh, playing Zelda I'm glad to hear you're playing Zelda I have friends that have gotten the switch and they're like I haven't played Zelda I'm like that's the first game you should buy it's so unbelievably good it should be the first that's why I came out with the switch because it's the first game you should buy because it's so unbelievably good so I guess we'll wrap up with um just just a question for me what comics are you reading right now what is your and what is your favorite comic series I mean I'm a huge Spider-Man guy my favorite, uh, I wouldn't say comic series, I guess the graphic novel series, Scott Pilgrim is my absolute favorite. I can read that every day, cover to cover all six issues and then do it again the next day. I love it so much. So what are your favorites? Well, first of all, I'm going to have to put that on my list because I loved the movie. So Scott Pilgrim is going on my but list. But you haven't read the, you haven't read the, the, I got you. No. I got you. I, if you need them, I, I have them. I will send them to you. You can read them when you have some downtime. They're, they're, unbelievably good they're unbelievably thank good. you i appreciate it so that's that's great to hear um i'm big anything marvel especially if it's a team situation you get me with the avengers the x-men the power pack i don't know if you've ever heard of power pack um I, I was a huge fan of them as a kid um i inherited my love of comic books from my dad he's got over four thousand books and so i have tons and tons of books that i keep telling him are my inheritance um <laughs> that are from the 70s and 80s and early 90s and so i read a lot of those but right now in the show we have a little club between myself king george and the gentleman who understudies me uh he's a standby for aaron burr alexander hamilton and a few others we are all reading three or four different series at the same time we just got finished with um oh the why the last man which was lovely mm -hmm. we are doing saga waiting for book number nine to come out uh currently i'm in love with paper girls which i think is really phenomenal it's about paper girls that are fighting an alien invasion like 15 year old paper girls fighting an alien invasion it's very cool and then the other one is i decided i wanted to go ahead and read the walking dead series so i'm on book oh, nice. three or four of the walking dead series and it's very different than the TV show, which I consumed rapidly, um, <laughs> very different. So it's like it's like I I know that story, but now I'm getting this other version of the story, which is also very cool. So those are those are the high ones on my list right now. And the the best one of them all so far is Saga. Saga is just phenomenal. I'll have to check that out. Is that that's a graphic novel saga, or is it a comic series? Yeah, it's a graphic novel. It's the same guy who did Why the Last Man. Okay. Um, which I don't know you they did the TV series of it which mm -hmm. only got one season um but he's just a very interesting writer and he goes down these roads that you just never know what's coming so it's I I love some of these that are becoming the TV TV adaptations um 
was at the end of the fucking world, which was the graphic novel became a Netflix. I think it, two, it gave it two seasons, but the first season was the graphic novel. Second season, they kind of took their liberties. I, I just, and Scott Pilgrim obviously became a fantastic movie from that. I love reading them and seeing that such, there's such differences. And then like you watch it on and it just the creative liberties they take sometimes, the things they can, like Scott P Pilgrim did such an excellent job of taking stuff off the page and putting it right on your screen. They did such a good job. And it's just cool to see that as different things. And, but I'm gonna have to check some of those out. I'm glad that you like Marvel and we're gonna get along great if you like Marvel. I'm a huge Marvel <laughs> head. Uh, it's it comics wise, it's really I I read Batman, but I also read a lot of Marvel. Um, I'm a little behind. What is that? Every everybody will just dabble in bat in Batman whenever it's DC. Just the it's, Batman. I don't know. I because the stories are so good. You know, they have the best villain of all time. You know, the Joker is he's just so complex, but there's also so much you don't know about him. And it's just, it makes it such an interesting, that's why whenever a guy goes on screen, they're either booed off the stage or given an Oscar. Like it's one or the other, cause it's just such a complex character to play. Um, but I don't know. It's just, I, it's just cause it's bad. I get, I, I have a couple theories. One, because the stories are easily relatable, even though they're not relatable. And also because a lot of us, especially uh, at, you know, in the twenties and thirties, we watched the Batman animated series. And that was like our first real or Batman 1989 for some people, that was your first real look into com or into the comic book world. So then you're like, oh, well, this is based off a book. I kind of want to read it. And that's kind of how a lot of people get into it. But then Marvel came out with a lot of the movies. Now you, you're an avid person that you were a comic book fan before the movies. I actually started reading Spider-Man when I was in the single digits, I don't know, like seven or eight, we would get them at uh, like flea markets and markets and stuff like that. There would be like 10 for a dollar. So I'd go and pick out all the ones I'd want. And I had a huge collection of them from that. And then the movie came out when I was young, the uh, Raimi one came out when I was young. So that really got me more into and stuff like that. But I think that's why you see so many people love Spider-Man and Marvel because of the movies, but the Batman animated series, Batman 1989, got so many people into it that they just kind of read it. And now, you know, in that time, the killing joke has come out. The three jokers have come out, you know, Batman year one has come out. Like there's so many great stories from Batman and like act, the classics, top classics of all time. So that's my theory. Yeah. at least. <laughs> I mean, I just love that you identify as a brooding billionaire. I love that for you. <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> I'm not trying to toot my own horn. <laughs> I'm just the billionaire that fights crime. It's just, oh, wait, I'm go. not supposed to say that. Damn. Yeah. <laughs> but, Thank you for well, joining us. Your secret us. is safe with me. Okay, good. I, I, the other people that watch, I'm not sure, but with you, that's you shouldn't say it on air. You shouldn't say it on air. Alfred told you that. <laughs> uh, thank you for joining us. We really appreciate you taking time. Good luck on the rest of Hamilton. Where can people find you if they're trying to look for you on social media or anywhere else? Yeah, you can find me at Julius Thomas Three. Um, that's either the number three, I think on instagram it's the number three and i think on mm -hmm. twitter it was already taken so it's i i i roman numeral three <laughs> so at julius thomas three but if you search julius thomas and put a three behind it i'm sure i'll pop up yeah it's just I'm me and the football player so <laughs> i'm gonna say you know, it'll be between you and the, the broncos player <laughs> one of the there two will go. pop up there if you're you in a broncos <laughs> uniform go with the other one the other one right will be that and if you're looking for the <laughs> football player the one that has the the 1700s outfit on go with the one that's not in the 1700s outfit so that's how you, there you go differentiate <laughs> well thank you for joining us uh i loved hamilton if you haven't seen hamilton definitely go out and see it you guys are in vancouver now uh where are you next in idaho i believe uh edmonton then calgary and then seattle Okay, I was not even close. So Edmund, <laughs> Calgary, right. Seattle, you can go to uh, Hamilton, the musical, you can look that up, go to the website and find all these dates. Um, and they are you guys are the Peggy tour, correct? Yeah, and Peggy tour. Yep. And Peggy tour. So you can find it in the and Peggy tour. Thank you so much for joining us. And we appreciate you being here. Thank you for listening to Mad Props with Chris Schnabel. You can catch older episodes on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also follow the show at schnabel.studios, don't forget that dot, schnabel.studios on Instagram, or at Schnabel Studios on Twitter. You can also find shows such as Sketching Up and more at the Schnabel Studios pages. Mad Props is a Schnabel Studios production. Thank you for listening, and see you next time.